Greetings to everyone. Um, I thought I'll take this time to talk about something that uh, many of us do not think about. Many of us don't give it a thought. Uh, I call it the forgotten spiritual discipline, uh, which many of us are supposed to have and we have forgotten about it. Um, and the reason is because, uh, as you know, at the beginning of this year, I have uh, announced that we are going to have uh, a monthly day of prayer and fasting. Uh, and we are continuing to do that. Uh, and uh, I'm recording this today on um, Friday, uh, the 22nd of May, uh, which is one of these uh, days of prayer and fasting. So I thought uh, there might be others who are struggling with the idea of uh, fasting and say, uh, why go through the bother? Why go through the pain? Why go through the uh, inconvenience of having to miss your lunch or your breakfast, your dinner, whatever the case may be? Uh, why do this in the first place? So I want to just uh, spend uh, uh, a few minutes to talk about that. So for those that uh, are fasting, maybe it will remind you of why you are doing it. For those that have not been participating in the fasting, maybe it will encourage you to realize that this is something that you need to do. So I'm going to talk to uh, a number of questions. Firstly, I will answer the question, what is fasting? Uh, why do we fast? Uh, I will also address the issue, is it a sin not to fast, for example? So if you are not participating in these uh, monthly day, days of prayer and fasting, uh, are you committing a sin? Is it something bad that you should feel bad about? So we are going to look at that as well. Uh, what is the biblical basis for fasting? Is there a biblical basis for fasting? Uh, does fasting force God to do certain things that we want him to do when we pray? So those are the questions that I would like us to look at uh, as we explore this idea uh, of fasting. So why do we fast? Uh, firstly, fasting is abstaining from food. When I was still young, um, when my English was still very poor uh, growing up in my village, uh, the first time I heard about fasting, I had no clue what the guy was talking about when he said that he fasts once every week. Uh, so I had no clue what he was talking about. So I only found out later that when he said he fasted every week, it meant uh, fasting as we understand it now that uh, it is abstaining from food uh, and or drink for a period of time. It might be uh, missing your lunch is a fast, uh, missing your breakfast, lunch and dinner is a fast, uh, missing your meals for two or three days or for 40 days as Jesus did uh, and Moses did and many other people did. Uh, that is what a fast is. A fast is uh, staying away from food uh, and drink. That's all it means. Uh, or staying away from those things that your body craves. Uh, that's what fasting is. You can fast from uh, TV, for example. You can say for a month, I'm going to fast from TV. I'm not going to watch TV. And uh, during that time, you dedicate yourself to prayer and to other things. That's what fasting is. Now, it just reminds me of a story of a little a boy uh, who used to be taken to church by his mother. Uh, and the pastor then that day uh, in his sermon, he mentioned that uh, uh, that Sunday uh, was a day of uh, fasting and therefore no cooking uh, must take place or is taking place uh, at home because people are fasting. Now, the little boy, not knowing what fasting means, uh, he thought that uh, when the pastor said uh, there's, uh, there's a fast going on uh, and uh, people are not supposed to cook, uh, he thought that, okay, it means now they are going to go to the fast food um, uh, restaurant uh, like McDonald's or Kentucky or... Um, any of these uh, fast food places that sell uh, food. He thought, okay, so today we're not going to cook when we get home. Mom is going to buy some fast food. So on their drive home, uh, as the mother was driving past McDonald's or whatever shop it was, uh, the boy looked at the mother and said, hey, you are passing. Um, and the mother said, uh, I'm passing what? She said, you're yeah, passing the fast, the fast food place. Uh, the pastor said, today is a day of fasting. Uh, and therefore, you are not going to cook when we get home. So I thought you are going to buy uh, some McDonald's for us to eat when we get home. Uh, and then the mother obviously had to explain to the child what fasting means. That fasting is not about fast food. Fasting is staying away from fast food. It's staying away from all food. So that's what fasting is. So uh, if um, you wanted to understand what fasting is, that's what fasting is. It is simply abstaining from food. Uh, and fasting, I think today for many believers is the most neglected of all spiritual disciplines. And um, 
There are other spiritual disciplines like studying the Bible, uh, like praying, um, like um, solitude, um, like meditation, um, and many others. But uh, this one, I think, is one of those that are the mostly neglected ones. So I just want us not to be one of those that neglect it. So I want us today to revisit it and think about it uh, so that every month as we go through our uh, monthly days of prayer and fasting, uh, we know what we are doing and why we should be doing it. Okay? So we need it in our journey, firstly, towards healthy church. We have said that our vision is to become a healthy church in 2025. And one of that, for me, is a church that fasts, uh, is Christians who fast. Um, we can't be healthy Christians uh, if we don't fast. Uh, I know some of you might disagree, but I think uh, we are fooling ourselves if we think that we are going to be strong, um, courageous uh, Christians uh, if we never fast. Um, so we'll go through that also to show you why, in fact, it is so that we should be fasting. Uh, I would like just, I just want to start uh, by reading a passage from the book of Philippians chapter 3 verse 19. Uh, and when I read it uh, many years ago, it made me uh, be very concerned about this. Uh, not that it changed my behavior that much, uh, but uh, in further reflection in recent years, I have found that it is something that we need to take seriously uh, about the point that Paul is making. So let's read. Uh, Philippians chapter 3 verse 19. He says, uh, talking about the people uh, that he was talking about, he says their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach. Imagine that. God, Paul says there are people whose God is their stomach. And he says their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. Their mind is set on earthly things. Yesterday was Ascension Day. And Ascension Day tells us that we are ascended to heaven, we are seated at the right hand of the Father in Jesus Christ. And therefore we can't be people who are concerned, whose mind are set on earthly things. Our minds are supposed to be set on things of God, on heavenly things. And Paul here rebukes some people in Philippians. He says, their God is their stomach. I hope that we are not those kind of people that Paul is talking about. I hope that our stomachs are not our God. So what is the biblical, biblical basis for fasting? Why do we fast? Is it biblical? Does the Bible expect us to fast? I once uh, uh, was approached by somebody who said he doesn't believe that we should fast. And I asked him why, and he tried to explain from the scriptures why he thinks we should not fast. And so if you want a biblical basis why you should not fast, you probably can find it. But I believe that if you find such a reason that we should not fast, it is probably a misreading of what the Bible says. I think the biblical um, narrative the biblical view is that we as believers must fast. Jesus expects us to fast. Let's look at a few scriptures just to indicate that point. In um, the book of Matthew chapter 6, there's a number of things that Jesus says uh, in what we call the Sermon on the Mount. So I just want to read a few verses as we go through that, uh, starting from uh, uh, verse uh, 1. He says, So when you give, to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. You see what Jesus says? He doesn't say, if you give. He says, when you give. So Jesus takes it as a matter of fact that as believers, we are people who give to the needy. Okay? So if there are needy people around us, Jesus assumes that we are people who will give to them. So he says, when you give, don't tell the whole world that you are giving. Just give. Let not your left hand know what your right hand is doing. But once again, some people misunderstand what that means. All that means is that uh, you don't need to announce to the world 
but the person that you are giving to will know that you are giving them. Okay? So, for example, if you are making an offering to the church, it is not necessary for you to remain anonymous. Okay? If you are giving to the church, the church must know that you gave. But the church and yourself must not make it public to others that you gave. So it is between you and who that you are, the person that you are giving to. That's what it means, that don't let your left hand know what your right hand, right hand is doing. But so the first point that we see is that Jesus sees giving as a natural thing that Christians do. He says, when you give, don't let others know like hypocrites do. And then in verse 5, he says the same thing. He says, when you pray, do not be like hypocrites. But when you pray, you go into your room and your father who sees what is done in secret, will hear your prayers and answer you. Okay? So once again, he doesn't say, if you pray, as if praying is something that we must do when we feel like it. He says, when you pray, because he expects us to pray all the time. And the question is, do you pray? Okay? And then he continues in verse 16, still of Matthew chapter 6. And then he says, when you fast... Do not look somber as the hypocrites do. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face. And your father, in verse 18, your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Okay? So, Jesus says, giving, praying, and fasting are things he expects us to do. And he says, when you do them, do them in secret. So although we announce that we're having a day of prayer and fasting, that's why I will not be asking you to announce whether you are participating or not. Everyone must decide for themselves whether they're going to pray and fast with us or not. It is up to you. Nobody has to know whether you're doing it. And if you're doing it, and if it's during the week, you don't have to tell and show your colleagues at work that you are fasting. Okay? So you, 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 you wash normally, you dress properly, uh, you, you put uh, um, uh, oil on your lips so that your lips don't dry up, so that people don't ask you and say, why do you look hungry? You don't have to look like you're fasting. Do it in secret. That's all Jesus is saying. He says, when you give, when you pray, when you fast, do it quietly because you are doing it for God and for you. So once again here, what we're finding is that Jesus sees these things as something that we do as a matter of fact. So fasting is one of those things that Jesus expects us to do. So if there is anything else, fasting is something that Jesus expects us to do. There was a time when the Pharisees went to Jesus and says, uh, we fast twice a week, but we have never seen your disciples fasting. Why don't they fast? Do you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, well, they are not fasting because I'm still with them. But once I'm gone, they will fast. Now, yesterday, as I said, was Ascension Day. Jesus has gone to heaven. And Jesus has said, after he has ascended to heaven, he expects us to fast. And therefore, if we don't fast, if we never fast, then we are not doing that, that which Jesus said we must do. Jesus said, when he has ascended to heaven, we will fast. And Ascension is a reminder of that, that we must fast. And the question is, are you doing that? I don't want to put a guilt on you. I'm just raising the point that don't forget this spiritual discipline of fasting. It is something that Jesus expects us to do. Let's just look at some other biblical evidence of fasting from several people who did it and today we're still expected to do it. The first one is the story of Ahab. Okay. Um, in 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 27 to 29, it says, when Ahab heard these words, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and fasted. He lay in sackcloth and went around meekly. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, the Tishbite. Have you noticed how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself, I will not bring the disaster in his day, but I will bring it on his house in the days of his son. Now, Elijah had just given Ahab a prophecy that God says this is what he's going to do because you are not behaving. But when Ahab heard that, he repented 
in fasting and prayer. And God goes to Elijah and says, Have you seen how Ahab has repented in prayer and fasting? And because he has done that, the disaster that was going to befall his family will not befall his family during his lifetime. It will happen during the time of his son. I will spare him the pain because he repented. He humbled himself before God. So that's one example that when we need to humble ourselves before God in repentance, fasting is a possible response. The second example of biblical fasting is that of Ezra. When Ezra heard about the situation um, uh, of Jerusalem, um, he proclaimed a fast. Okay? It says Ezra proclaimed a fast. That is in Ezra chapter 8, verse 21 to 23. Ezra proclaimed a fast so that they may humble themselves. They fast, excuse me, they fasted and petitioned God. They asked for a safe passage for themselves and God answered them. Okay? So once again, we'll come, we'll come back to the point of does fasting force God to do certain things? Okay? Because you might read this and think, oh, okay, so it looks like if I fast, God will be forced to do what I'm asking him to do. But we'll come back to that point uh, as we go on. Okay? Other examples of fasting, um, which I won't go through because of time, uh, is that of Esther in Esther chapter 4. Esther fasted. Uh, is the king of Nineveh when he heard about the destruction of the, of, 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 of the city when Jonah preached. Uh, the king of Nineveh called a fast for the whole town, for the whole city, and they fasted, and God saved the city of Nineveh. Uh, the church in Antioch that we read about in the book of Acts, chapter 13, we are told that while they were fasting and praying, the Spirit said to them, set apart for me Paul and Barnabas. Okay? So the New Testament church was a church that fasted and prayed all the time. And I want our churches to become churches that pray and fast. Because that's what the apostolic church did. That's what the New Testament church of Jesus Christ does. It understands that Jesus said, when I've ascended, when I've left, my disciples will fast. And I want us to be like that church. Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23-27, he talks about that. He talks about how many times he has fasted. Okay? So, fasting is something that is expected of us as believers. It's something that we must do all the time. God expects us to do that. But let's answer the question, does fasting force God's hand? Is fasting a way of twisting the arm of God to do what we want? Okay? So firstly, fasting is not a hunger strike. It's not just going without food. Okay? But also, fasting is not different to giving and praying as we saw earlier. Okay? So if you are a person who gives, if you are a person who prays, you are also supposed to be a person who fasts because Jesus expects us to do that. He says when you give, when you pray, when you fast, you must do it in secret. So we're expected to do that. Okay? But just as praying and giving does not force God's hand to do anything, fasting does not force God's hand to do anything. Okay? So we don't pray because we want to force God to do something. We don't give to the needy because we want to force God to do anything. We give to the needy because it is the right thing to do. We pray because it is the right thing to do. We fast because it is the right thing to do for Christians. Okay? Fasting is for focused prayer. You can't do fasting without prayer. Fasting and prayer go together. They are twin sides. They are two sides of the same coin. Okay? Not to say that every time you pray, you must fast. But it's to say that every time you fast, you must pray. Fasting and prayer go together. Fasting without prayer is just a hunger strike. It is not worth it. So when you are on a fast, you must spend most of your time in prayer. Because that's why we fast. We fast so that we can be in prayer, humbling ourselves before our God. So there must not be fasting without prayer. Fasting must always be accompanied by prayer. That's why we call our monthly day 
of fasting, a monthly day of prayer and fasting. They, they, they go together. Okay? So what does fasting do? Fasting is there to make us focus on prayer for an extended period of time. Because most of the time, most of us, we have one minute here, two minutes there, three minutes there to pray. But we never really spend time in prayer. And fasting forces us to do that. If you are going to fast for 24 hours, if you are going to fast for half a day, if you are going to fast for three days, if you are going to fast for 40 days, you're going to be forced to spend time in prayer, to spend time talking to God. So fasting is like going on a holiday with God. It's to take yourself out of your busy life and say, I'm going to spend some time with my Father. That's what fasting is about. It's about having focused prayer over an extended period of time. Because when we don't do that, every few hours, your stomach starts that saying, you need to eat. And then you eat, a few hours later, your stomach says, I want to eat again. And if you are not careful, therefore, you find that you don't even have time to pray. Sometimes other people, the only time they pray is before they eat. They say a blessing for the meal. That's the only prayer they make per day. We can't be people who only pray when we eat. Because then we have turned our stomachs to be our gods, as Paul says in Philippians 3. That their stomach is their god. That we only pray to God when we are hungry, when we are about to eat. Let's not be people like that. Let's be people who pray all the time. Okay? So what is the nature of uh, 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 prayer and fasting? So firstly, let me talk about prayer because I've mentioned the link between prayer and fasting. Okay? So how do we pray? So often some of the postures of prayer is this. We go like this when we pray. Why do we do this? Because this is a sign of humility. When you do this to somebody, you are subjecting yourself to them. You are saying, please. Okay? So when we approach God, we approach Him humbly. We approach Him as His children. We approach Him as His subject. That's why you are always here when, when fasting is mentioned. It says, He humbled Himself. So the other, the other word used in the Old Testament about fasting is humbling yourself. So when the, 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 the Old Testament talks about humbling yourself, it is talking about, pray, uh, about fasting and praying. So doing this is a sign of humility when we pray. So that's why we do that. So if you, don't, if you are not in the habit of doing that, I want you to learn the habit of saying when you pray, kneel. So kneeling is also a posture of prayer. When you go down on your knees, it's a, it's, 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 a, it's a posture of humility. It's a ritual of humility. How do you know somebody is humbling themselves when they go down on their knees? How do you know that they are humbling themselves when they do this with their hands? Please, can I have your permission? That's humbling yourself to the person you are talking to. That's, so these things are not just rituals because our bodies respond to ritualistic things, physical things that we do. So when you do this, it's difficult to do that. I don't know whether you've been to a funeral. If you have been, ever been to a funeral and you see a young child uh, speaking maybe at the funeral of their father or their mother and they're giving a speech and in the middle of the speech they start crying. It is very difficult for everybody who's listening to that child not to start crying with the child. Because tears... Do something to us. When you see somebody else tears, you cannot not be affected. And so it is, when you do this, you are humbling yourself before God. God can see inside your heart. When you do that, your heart has to be humbled. You can't do this without your heart being humbled. You can't go on your knees without your heart being humbled. Okay? So that's what it means to humble yourself. To humble yourself is about humbling your heart. To get rid of the pride in your life. And fasting does that. It forces you to get rid of all pretensions in your own life. To get rid of all pride you have. So that when you approach God, you approach God humbly. And that is what it means to fast. Okay? So the general posture of prayer is humility. And humility is fasting. The two go together as we said. So when you kneel down, 
when you lie prostrate, when you bow down in prayer, though all those are gestures of humility. And fasting is a spiritual gesture of humility. Fasting is a spiritual gesture of humility. When you fast, you are saying to God, I'm humbling myself before you. Go down on your knees. Bow down. Put your hands together and pray as you fast. That's when you force your heart to take a posture of humility and approach God with humility. In Ezra chapter 8, that I didn't read earlier, let me just read verse 21. It says, There, by the Ahava canal, I proclaimed a fast. This is Ezra. So, so that we might humble ourselves before our God. So when I asked for our monthly day of prayer and fasting, I'm asking us that monthly, one day a month, we must humbly together humble ourselves before our God. To say, we know by ourselves we can do nothing. We want to hear what your will is. We want to do what your will is. We want to align our will to yours. That's what we're trying to do by this uh, monthly uh, fastings. And you don't have to fast once a month, by the way. You can fast anytime you want. But I would like us as a church, once a month on that specific day, to all join together in prayer and fasting. But the question remains, why do we have to humble ourselves in the posture of prayer and fasting? I'll give you a few reasons from the scriptures why humility is something that God responds to when he sees us in that. 1 Peter 5 verse 5 says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. God resists the proud. Now, if you approach God with pride, if you approach God with arrogance, whatever it is, attitude you have, Peter says God resists the proud. Now, I don't want to be resisted by God. I want, when I go to God, God to welcome me with open arms. And the Bible tells us to do that, we must humble ourselves. We must know that we are human beings and He is God. We can never be of the same level with Him. We remain human beings, we remain His creatures. And we approach Him with the dignity, with the honor, with the reverence that He deserves. And prayer and fasting forces us to do that. When we kneel down, when we lie down in prayer, when we bow down in prayer, when we fast, we are proclaiming that indeed we are not Him. He is and He alone is God. And that's what fasting does. So God resists the proud and prayer, uh, prayer and fasting helps us to humble ourselves so that we are not resisted by God when we approach Him. In James 4 verse 6, he repeats the same thing. He says, God gives grace generously. As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Okay? So James uses the word oppose. Resist, oppose. So Peter says God resists the proud, and James says God opposes the proud. Now, I don't want to be opposed by God. I want what I do to be in line with what God wants to do so that I'm not in opposition with what God is doing. And prayer and fasting helps us to know what God is doing so that we are not in opposition to God. In Proverbs 16, verse 5, verse 5, it says, The Lord detests the proud. Detests. Detest is a very strong word. He hates the proud. And fasting helps us to get rid of that kind of thing in our lives. So why do we need to be humble? So that we can approach God with the humility that we deserve. With the humility that only God deserves. Okay? So why should we value humility? In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, the familiar verse, I'll read it because it is, makes a very important point. It says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then God says, I will hear, and I will forgive their sin, and heal their land. 
God says, if we humble ourselves, he will hear us. But if we don't humble ourselves and we say, no, no, we can do it ourselves. The fact the world is facing COVID-19 pandemic. But if the world does not think that it needs God, if the world thinks that we can sort out COVID-19 by ourselves, God says, okay, your will be done. And you will see how many people are going to die with that approach, with that thinking. But if the world, if the churches, if us as the children of God will humble ourselves and plead with him, God will hear us and he will heal our land. He will heal our world. God promises to hear those who humble themselves when we pray. You see, when we pray in the Lord's Prayer, it says, Thy will be done. Do you know what God says when you say that? When we say to him, thy will be done, he responds in the same way. He says, your will be done. So the question is, if my will is not in line with the will of God, and then God says, your will be done, my will is going to be done. And I don't want my will to be done. I want God's will to be done. I want my will and God's will to be aligned. So that when I say, your will be done, and God says back to me, yes, your will be done. Then the will of God is done. Because my will and the will of God are aligned. Fasting and prayer is about aligning our will to the will of God. So that whatever we do, we are doing what God wants. And therefore we are not in opposition to him. That he doesn't resist us. That he doesn't detest what we are doing. That's what fasting and prayer is about. So let's conclude. Fasting is a necessary part of being a Christian. Just like praying and giving and worshiping God, worshiping God, fasting is expected of us. Jesus said, when I've left, when I'm ascended back to heaven, my disciples will fast. He expects you and I to fast. God shows favor as we saw. He shows favor and grace to those who humble themselves through prayer and fasting. Because God is God and we are humans who are creatures. We must never approach God in our prayers with arrogance, with pride, and anything like that. And fasting and prayer help us to make our heart to be humble. That is why when you pray, it matters what posture you, are, you, 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 you take when you pray. Do you bow your head? Do you kneel or do you go down on your knees and kneel down? Do you bow down? Do you clasp your hands? These things are important because when we do that, it also forces our minds and our hearts to be humble and we approach God with the right attitude. So let's not take these things lightly. They are important. They are part of what it means to be a child of God. Fasting does not twist God's will, but it twists our will towards God's will. Let me repeat that because that's the, if you forget anything, that's the one thing you must remember. Fasting does not twist God's will, but it twists our will to God's will. And his will is always perfect for us. Enjoy your fast. Amen.